The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, a dragon a day keeps the triads away. The agony and the ecstasy of the slush master general. Plus, a pan of purple praise for the Bane newsletter, totally deserved, I might add. And part 15 of the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. All right now. Welcome to the Bane Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. Coming up, we have an interview with Sarah A. Hoyt. Sarah has a new entry in her Shifter series called Noah's Boy. It's a sequel to Draw One in the Dark and Gentleman Takes a Chance. Love those titles. We also have a discussion with Bain Slushmaster General Gray Reinhardt. If you've ever thought about submitting a science fiction or fantasy novel to a publisher, and to Bain in particular, you won't want to miss this. So stay tuned for greatness, but first, Bain Associate Editor Laura Haywood Corey joins me for the news. Hey, I want to take a moment to mention the Bain email newsletters you can sign up for. These go out twice a month on the 1st or thereabouts, and the 16th pretty much. The one on the 1st is the Print Books newsletter. It is also the newsletter that contains info on our monthly Bain contest. By the way, the July contest is going to be a whopper for some enterprising artist out there. You can't say anything more about it? No, not yet. Soon. Can you give us just a hint? Yeah, well, one word. Kaboom. Wait, is, isn't that two words? Uh, that's a editorial mystery. And is it hyphenated? Yeah, I would say so, but some would kill you over, over that question. Anyway, Newsletter One also announces all the new Bane releases for the coming month. These are the books that will be available in bookstores and at booksellers everywhere for that month. The most jam-packed of the two newsletters is the one that comes out on the 16th. That one is the ebook newsletter. That's what we call it. That's the one where we announce the new eARCs, the new Bain ebook subscription books, plus all the great free content on the Bain.com website. Yeah, we refresh the Bain.com main page every month on the 15th, and we put a new short story up. It's all free and new free nonfiction. If you like Bain books, these newsletters are great resources. They really let you know what's going on without hounding you to buy stuff. Yep, we let the books and the free content speak for itself. That we do. To sign up to get these things, go to the Bain.com webpage and look on the right-hand sidebar. Don't you mean the left-hand sidebar? The left-hand sidebar. There's a link that will get you signed up. And we don't share any email addresses or send you a bunch of stuff. No, nope, just the newsletter. So sign up today. We want to welcome Sarah A. Hoyt to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Nice to talk to you again. Sarah A. Hoyt is originally from Portugal, but is a longtime U.S. citizen these days. She is the author of the Prometheus Award winning Dark Ship Thieves, as well as its sequels, Dark Ship Renegades and A Few Good Men, all from Bain Books. She is also the creator of the Shifter series. This began with Draw One in the Dark and Gentleman Takes a Chance, and now there's new title Noah's Boy out this month at Booksellers. The Dark Ship books are science fiction, and the Shifter books are probably contemporary fantasy involving shape-shifting lions, panthers, wolves, and dragons. Now, Sarah, I understand you consulted with a couple of biologists on how it might be scientifically possible for a shapeshifter to exist. Do you think your shifters are maybe some product of different evolution, or are they more or less magic? Actually, when I first got my conference in the bar, Sarah's Diner, uh, my uh, fans got in a heated argument about how they were really science fiction. And, and that's where most of those ideas came from. They might be science fiction. In the last book, there's sort of a feel that there might be alien technology involved. But, you know, I, I still get stuck with the uh, conservation of matter and the energy, and uh, I find it really hard to view them as, as real science fiction. So there's some really odd hybrid I, 
I can't describe. They're not your your traditional. I mean, there's no vampires. There's no. There's not your traditional urban fantasy. There's no vampires. There's no magic. Um, it's just a world where shifters exist, shape shifting. It's just a world where shifters exist, and uh, as a slight spoiler on Noah's boy, it might be alien technology. Um, Earth might have been seeded. They have what what would have been called in science fiction of the 70s psi powers of some sort, but they're not really magical and. I have no idea why I did this because, you know, it, it's just going to upset the fantasy people and the science fiction people that, hey, that's how they came up. Yeah. Well, it'll keep us keep us guessing until you either declare or don't declare on, <laughs> on that. So let me ask you about, all right, Draw One in the Dark, A Gentleman Takes a Chance, Noah's Boy. What are these titles? What do they mean? They're the old... Uh, diner slang. There's also short stories. There's Sweet Alice, which was water. It's, um, in, in the old diner slang, they had these kind of funny ways of ordering things. Um, draw one in the dark is black coffee. Gentleman takes a chance is hash. And, um, uh, Noah's boy is a ham sandwich. It, the, the the code in the book, which the fans have tumbled to, is that Tom Ormson's father comes in at the end of the book and orders something, and that's the title of the next book. So at the end of Noah's Boy, I have him order a bowl of red and a grilled cheese sandwich. And, of course, the fans immediately informed me as soon as the ER came out that grilled cheese sandwich is a funny name for a book. <laughs> But it's, of course, supposed to be Bowl of Red, which is tomato soup. Yeah, I hope it's Bowl of Red. Or you may have to break your tradition. Tradition is uh, So, Noah's Boy is a fish sandwich or a ham sandwich? Ham sandwich. Oh, a ham sandwich? Yes, ham in the Bible is Noah's son. Oh, yeah, I get it. There we go. <laughs> Most of these are really corny, but, you yeah. know, I I like it, so... So, and of course, they they have a tie in to the plot of the book too. I mean, the the name itself. Yeah, the, your main character Tom Ormson owns the diner, which is uh, what's the name of the diner again? It's uh, the George. The George, um, and he he has a major character in the book, and he's a dragon shifter. Yeah. Um, and a big portion of Noah's Boy is about the struggle with the dragon shifter hierarchy for a successor to to the great dragon. Um, is he the Grand Dragon or the Great Dragon? Great he, Dragon. Great Sky Dragon. Yeah. He believes he's about to be toast. Something bad is about to happen. Um, not only that, the Great Dragon has all the things planned out for Tom to um, to take over and to start breeding an heir at the beginning yes. of the book. Can you explain how the magic works here, how the shift shifter power gets handed down and, and why? I actually, I actually consulted with, with a scientist about this. Um, and what happens, what we're not fully, well, I'm not fully sure about, although it was explained to me, is how it activates. But there, the information is transferred in the Y chromosome. So you have to be a direct male descendant with the ability to shift. And the only one that the great sky dragon has is Tom. Even though the line is thousands of years old, Tom is the first shifter. So he is the, you know, thousands time grandson of the Great Sky Dragon, but the information to become the Great Sky Dragon is encoded in his Y chromosome. And what happens is when the Great Sky Dragon dies, his, his knowledge activates. So he receives, it's kind of like, you know, the, the, the heir to the throne in any fantasy where all of a sudden he receives all the arcane knowledge. Only, of course, Tom doesn't want to rule a bunch of dragons. Um, and he doesn't want the mind connection to all these people, a lot of whom are triads and, and involved in illegal stuff. Uh, let's just say he's not a very happy person in this book. Yeah, when he suddenly uh, suddenly gets this sort of mental download. Yes. So, 
the other thing about it is that uh, Tom has a girlfriend, a very close, you know, a live-in girlfriend in Kiri, but the Great Sky Dragon has other plans, and that's how we uh, how we open the book. Who is B, and how has she come into the story? She's a um, she's a panther shifter, which is the big problem the Great Sky Dragon has with her because um, the shifting characteristic can only reproduce if it's the same type of shifter, and hers isn't. And yeah, you're um, talking about Kiri. The, yes, Kiri. Yeah. And Kiri was a Kiri was working at the diner in the first book, and it's when she met Tom. And she kind of fell in love with him despite herself. Tom is, Tom is interesting. Um, I, I find myself sort of riding along with his mind. I mean, when he decides he wants to do things like make body shaped, don, body part shaped donuts for Halloween and fill them with red jelly, you know. He's very much, in a way, sort of like my kids, is very much a young guy and has these, hey, let's do this. It would be so much fun. And Curie has to be the voice of reason because even though they're about the same age, but she's a little more mature. She has had to, she was raised in a series of foster homes and she has had to grow up a little faster. Well, she's pretty, um, she's pretty tough. Um, when she gets kidnapped, she does not give up. And I, I really enjoy those little details of her entrapment where she's digging away at the caulk in the window and she's just she's not even stopping for a minute to consider that she might be trapped there forever she's going to get out no she she's not she's not used to people looking after her so she looks after herself and and both she and tom try to look after other people too so they've become sort of the heart of this little shifter family there's a reason shifters are attracted to the to the diner, which is part of the setup for the first book. So they get a lot of shifters in, and they become sort of the parents of this ragtag band. Although they're, you know, some of them are older than they are, but but they're sort of the stable core of the group. Yeah, the, some of the others include, uh, well, there's Raphael, is it Raphael? Raphael Troll? Raphael, Raphael. yes. He's a shifter cop. Now, he has a mission, he considers it his mission to kind of hide the the shifters from the general populace. Like, if there's a shifter crime, he's going to make it either... But he still wants, he is a third-generation cop, although he's the only shifter. So, he still has that ingrained, I have to do this, but I also have to serve justice. So, he still has to find a way to punish the crime, which, of course, means he has to be a bit of a vigilante and makes him feel guilty because he'd prefer to work within the law. So he works kind of in the twilight, you know, where he's trying to serve both sides and, and be good for both sides. Um, is One of the things in his back history was that his high school girlfriend was also shifted. That's in the short story, Sweet Alice. His... Uh, High school girl, girlfriend was also a shifter, but he doesn't find out until she's murdered. And that's when he kind of decided that there needed to be someone who could both investigate crimes committed by shifters and crimes against shifters. So, so he's very much a protector, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, and he's a lion shifter, isn't he? Yes, he's Which a lion shifter. Symbolizes that. He's a, yeah, he's one conflicted guy, but he, uh, he gets a love interest in this, uh, in Noah's oh, yes. Boy as well. Um, I, he had to, sort of, because uh, all the female fans have been giving me trouble over this. It's like, when is Raphael going to find someone? So, of course, you know, I get him in the most complicated position possible, but yes, he does. He gets a girlfriend, and, and she will be, she will be a big character going forward. There's also Conan, and who oh, is a dragon shifter, and uh, wants to be a country singer, and he is my husband's favorite character. Oh yeah. yeah. I was very afraid in this, in this book that he was going to die, and and my husband threatened me with dire stuff if I killed him. So, 
Well, Tom, uh, I, in the book, Tom is dreadfully afraid that he's going to be horrible. Yes, he's afraid he's going to be a horrible singer, and of course he's not. He's, he's, he's actually wonderful. But, you know, it's it seems, because he's Asian and he, his, his parents are first-generation immigrants, it seems like a very odd ambition to want to be a country western singer. So, But since my husband used to write and compose music, although not country western, when we got married, I think that's why he's bonded with the character. Well, tell us about this. The other wonderful character in the book is your crocodile shifter. Old Joe. Um, old Joe is old. Uh, he, he might be one of the oldest people on earth. It's hard to tell because, and, and here is where I rely on my scientist sources, because if you really lived thousands and thousands of years, you'd get really muddled. And he has problems with language, and what comes out is not always very clear, but he is thousands and thousands of years old. He doesn't like, he doesn't particularly like being human. He doesn't feel very um, comfortable. It's kind of like us putting good clothes on. We might look good, but, you know, after a couple of hours, you want into your comfy clothes. And it's the same sort of thing. He feels more comfortable as, as, uh, an alligator, and uh, except he, he might wear a fedora now and then, and uh, and spook people or a t-shirt. And there was, of course, the uh, the the incident in in Noah's boy, in which he was preparing to eat the kitten. whom Tom saves and who becomes naughty, which is short for not dinner because Tom brought him into the dinner and announced to everyone, this is not dinner, <laughs> just in case there were, you know, shifters around. And uh, Kiri understood that was the cat's name, so he became naughty. Not. Old Joe is doesn't necessarily follow regular human morals. No, he doesn't. He doesn't fully understand human morals. He is. He is very moral, but he is very moral by his own lights. And he likes Tom and Kiri, so he tries to be nice to them because they were nice to him. But uh, but he's not very civilized. Now, do the do the shifters antedate humans? I believe so. It's what comes out in Noah's Boy. And right now, and it. It was a very difficult book to to write because it turned out I was missing part of what we'll call, for lack of a better word, the cosmogony of the world. I um, I knew what happened, but I couldn't see the architecture behind. And I ended up having to take it all apart and rewrite it twice until that part made sense. And yes, um, there is at least what the characters believe in the book is that um, some form of energy aliens colonized the earth before humans. Whether all humans are descended from them and the lack of shifting is a defect, I don't know yet. I, I kind of have a feeling that's it. Uh -huh. Well, to change tracks for a second, the book takes place in a town you call Goldport, Colorado. You, you really do a wonderful job of evoking this small city atmosphere. Um, I know you live in Colorado. Are you writing what you know when it comes to Goldport? Is this a... To an extent. To an extent. I, um, I live in Colorado Springs, which is, is not that small. But we lived for years in uh, Manitou Springs, which is a small mountain town. And when I started writing the book, I actually started the first book. I actually set it in Denver because I wanted the George to be roughly where my favorite diner is, Pete's Kitchen. Um, actually, uh, we have friends who live nearby and who keep doing walking, how do I put this, walking schematics of where things take place around there because the streets map pretty closely around the George and around Pete. The thing is I wanted to import neat features from other Colorado towns. I wanted there to be 
the castle, which is in reality in Manitou Springs. I wanted to have this really good burger place that's in Colorado Springs. I wanted to, to have the fun stuff from all these other towns. So I created a town and, and sort of... The funny thing is how many searches hit my blog and my website for tourism, Goldport, Colorado. <laughs> well, so like we, we are seriously tempted to do a website for Goldport, Colorado with, you know, the where the books take place and, and the things to see and then a note on where they actually are. Well, maybe some enterprising Hoyt fan will uh, will put that together at some point. That would be cool. Um, yeah. To uh, change tracks for a moment, uh, I think Hank, Hank Davis, the Bain editor emeritus, is here with us today. I think he has a question about your blogging. I, I actually feel kind of guilty because I noticed you missed a few days on the blog recently. I was wondering if that's because you were working on my story. I am I was stepped up at, at PJ Media, although I'm working mostly for lifestyle, but they want a minimum of three columns a week. Uh-huh. Okay. And, of course, you know, okay, the pay it's... isn't wonderful, but, but it's great publicity. So, but... And with my blog every day, I need to get this under control and do my blogs ahead in batches. Right. Although I can do fiction and nonfiction, what I find really hard is... I used to be a multilingual translator and and interpreter. And if I was interpreting simultaneously from more than one language, there was a lag time, what I called switch heads. Because when I was concentrating on one language, I only understood that language and then translated it to English. And then I had switched to understand the other sounds as language. So I tell people, just a minute, I'm switching heads, which probably sounded really odd. It's the same thing with fiction and nonfiction. They're different heads, different head spaces. Uh-huh. And although I can do both, it helps if I don't do both the same day. The problem I've been having, I got very upset over the whole Sifwa kerfuffle, and I don't like blogging from that place. I mean, I, I don't mind Sarah, being we're talking. are we talking about the recent kerfuffle with Mike Resnick and Barry Mossberg? Yes, where well, some, the... some, some not ladies got very offended at being called ladies, and... Uh, which is absolutely, and yes, I tracked down the posts and I read them and I'm baffled. I, there is nothing there. There is nothing even vaguely offensive and I got so upset. I mean, I've met Mike several times and, and we've hung out at cons and I was just so profoundly upset and I don't like to blog from that spot. Well, you well, still have, uh, I mean, you have stepped up. You're going to uh, be regularly blogging on Pajamas Media now. So oh, yes. We're gonna well, see and that's of... part of it, is that it has increased my blogging, <laughs> my blogging, um, whatever you call it, my blogging load exponentially and, and in conjunction. I know it sounds stupid, but doing a blog post a day is, after a while, it becomes strenuous. Oh, absolutely. Well, we enjoy uh, we enjoy following the nonfiction, but we really like the fiction. So, what are you working on these days, Sarah? Is it a new dark ship book? Are we going to see a continuation of uh, a few good men? It's it's sort of a continuation of a few good men. The the few good men, well, actually, and and dark ship revenge. They're insisting on coming out interlaced. So that I'm doing a chapter of one and running over to do a chapter of the other. So you but, you've kind of started. So you have two threads in the dark ship universe, which is the yes. Athena thread and the uh, the uh, Earth Revolution thread. The Earth Revolution. The thread. Earth Revolution uh, series is not going to be with the same characters all the time. Um, the characters will still be there, but as secondary characters in someone else's story. The next, the person who picks up the next narrative in Through Fire should be then shortly after Liberty Con, um, is then, then Sienna with the, um, with, for lack of a better word, Kit's sister. And, um, she stayed on Earth while the other people went 
back to Eden. And she's uh, the one that picks up. So you're kind of you're going to be alternating between in settings between uh, the dark ship uh, thieves um, asteroid habitat and Earth. Then it sounds like yes. Although they they end up coming to Earth again, but yes, there is in the in this next book, uh, Zen's story actually comes slightly before Dark Ship Revenge. Dark Ship Revenge comes in. Cena and Kit Kit come to Earth at the very end of it. So, and, and barely appear, if at all. I'm not sure yet if they appear in the chapter. I mean, the events that happen in, in Dark Ship Revenge will influence through fire, but whether the main character knows where they came from or not, I, I'm not sure yet. I haven't got to that point. What um, about a, what about a bowl of red? When are we going to see that? The next well, shifter. I'm hoping very. What I'm hoping to do this year has been very bad uh, in terms of health and and wobbles here in the household. So nothing particularly serious, but you know the type of thing that lays you out. So I'm late from where I wanted to be, but as I said, I'm hoping to finish. Through fire is due August first, I believe. I'm hoping to have it done slightly before that, maybe a week or two. Then uh, Dark Ship Revenge is due in December. Again, I hope to have it done around Halloween. And then I hope to do Bowl of Red. Well, but, even with your uh, ongoing uh, <laughs> health and sickness issues, you still turn out a prodigious amount. Uh, many writers would still be envious of, of what you're well, able to do. Well, part of this is that I don't have a life. I just write... <laughs> It's one of those things, the, the fans have a way of starting to breathe down your neck. You start getting those emails that say, I really don't want to bother you, but when are we going to get the next? And and I like to keep them happy. The book is Noah's Boy, the third book in Sarah A. Hoyt's Shifter series that's out next. It's out now, actually, at booksellers everywhere. It, it has a beautiful cover, and the cover is actually a fairly accurate depiction of the amusement park in which the amusement park on the in the book is based, which the amusement park is Lakeside in Denver, and it has one of the oldest wooden roller coasters in the country. Is that a Tom Kidd cover? I think it is. Yes, it is. He does, he does the shifters. Yeah. And Tony has assured me that there will be an omnibus of the first two books because I know a lot of people are hesitant to buy the third because the first one is no longer available in paper. Well, thanks for being with us, Sarah. Thank you. We like to ask some of the Bain behind-the-scenes folks onto the podcast to get their perspective on how all these great Bain books come about. As some of y'all know, Bain Books is one of the few places that considers unsolicited manuscript submissions. It's an honored tradition at Bain, in fact, and we've had several writers, including Lois McMaster Bujol, who were discovered in Slush. Now we're pleased to have with us Bain Slush Master General Gray Reinhardt. Hi, Gray. Hi, Tony. Happy to be here. Also along, we have Bain Editor Emeritus Hank Davis and Bain Associate Editor Laura Haywood Corey. Hi there. Hello. In addition to being the slush master general of Bain, Gray is a science fiction writer. He's had three stories published in Analog Science Fiction Magazine and two in Asimov's. Is that right, Gray? Uh, that would have been right up to a couple of months ago, but uh, I had now had a third story in Asimov's. In the July issue, I had a story called What is a Warrior Without His Wounds? Congratulations. Excellent. So Thank you. Appreciate six. it. Gray retired from the United States Air Force in 2006 as a lieutenant colonel. So maybe he's the lieutenant colonel slush master. No, wait, never mind. Where he was involved in rocket propulsion research operations and has seen many a rocket launch. He's also, dare we say it, a filker of some repute and is about to release an album. Gray, for those who don't know, what is filking and why would a sane man choose to do it? Well, I'll answer the first question first, and uh, the definition that I heard recently that I like is that filk is the particular and peculiar music of science fiction and fantasy fandom. 
as to why a sane person would choose to do it, I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know anybody like that. So let's talk Bane slush. First of all, let's define it. What is slush, Gray? Not everyone knows out there what it, it actually means. Well, slush is uh, the collection of unsolicited manuscripts, un unsolicited uh, manuscript proposals, story proposals, all the submissions that came in in what used to be termed over the transom in the days when old office buildings had actually a transom window above the door. Uh, the idea was that people would come by and just toss their stuff in because they couldn't get in the door. Uh, and these things would accumulate in a pile, uh, which gradually became known as the slush pile because, well, it's uh, just kind of dirty and, and messy and nobody really wants to do anything with it. A lot of the submission nowadays are electronic, is that? Well, especially for us, we get probably over 90% of our slush comes in uh, electronically. I was a slush reader for Bain years ago, and it was quite an experience to get thrown into a room full of slush. How did, uh, how did it strike you? How would you handle it? I guess my benefit was that I had read slush uh, on a smaller scale before actually taking on the, the task at Bain. Um, so you knew sort of what you were had, getting into. Well, I had I, I did know a little bit of what I was getting into because I uh, had read Slush for Orson Scott Card's Intergalactic Medicine Show for a period of time. Uh, they had a large backlog of submissions and needed some help getting through them. And since I had been to his uh, literary boot camp and uh, knew the editor, uh, knew what they were looking for, they asked me to help them out, and I actually picked a couple of pieces that eventually made it into the magazine. So when I took on the task at Bain, I was prepared for for what I would find in terms of the material. I don't think I was prepared for what I found in terms of the volume. Yeah, that's what uh, that's what struck me. Just I was overwhelmed. It's, you know, there's a lot of good stuff, but there was so much of it. <laughs> uh, and of course, it was all paper slush when I was having a, a go at it. So tell us what what well, is. Well, when I started, I was only doing paper, oh, and yeah. I would have boxes delivered to me at at uh, seventy or eighty pounds of material at a time would get uh, dropped off up at my doorstep by the UPS guy. Fills up your biceps, yeah. <laughs> and it fills up the recycling bin eventually. So, what is the usual process for a book submitted to Bain for consideration? How do people go about doing this if they would like to? Well, the first thing they do is they go on Bain.com and they read the guidelines, and then they follow the instructions, uh, which are pretty explicit in terms of uh, the fact that we prefer to receive uh, submissions electronically, but if people can't for one reason or another, or they just feel uh, that they would rather package up a paper submission, there are instructions for that as well. It goes into a queue then, is that correct? It does. Uh, it's uh, racked and stacked based on uh, date of submission, and uh, we try to we hit the oldest ones first and, and try very hard not to let the backlog build up too much. So what's your process for going through a manuscript and, and maybe tell us what some common mistakes are to avoid? Well, the very first thing that I'll do is, is especially if we're talking about the electronic slush, is I'll open up the file and usually there will be a cover letter and I'll take a quick look at the cover letter. And as long as the cover letter tells me whether it's science fiction or fantasy, and tells me the title of the novel and how long it is so that I know what to expect. Uh, that's really all I'm looking for. If they go into any little bit of detail, uh, giving me a, a brief glimpse into the story, like I would get if I picked up a book off the bookshelf and looked at the back cover, that's super. Uh, but it's not necessary. And if they've published things in the past um, and they want to relate that information in the cover letter, that's okay too. But again, it's not necessary. But I'll just I'll take a look at that, and I can tell 
if it is something that we are likely to be interested in, let me put it this way. I can usually tell if it's going to be something we're not likely to be interested in because if it's, for instance, a children's picture book, um, well, we've never published a children's picture book. So it's unlikely that we're going to be interested in that. And that is one of the more common mistakes uh, are the folks who have not read the guidelines or are not familiar with what we publish and yet they will submit their work anyway. We've received books of poetry. We have received uh, historical uh, books that were essentially someone's uh, master's or doctoral thesis uh, prettied up. Right, and then there's the ones who won't, either haven't read or or they email their submissions to directly to us instead of going through the submission process. And again, we see the Will you publish my biography? Will you publish my poetry or my children's picture book, like you said? And the ones that will, in the two field, they will list all of the publishers that they are emailing all at once. Yikes. Well, that's true. We do get a lot of those. I think you receive more of those in the main office, right. Laura, than, than I do through the e-editor's uh, mailbox. Uh, but the... Uh, Folks who email in, are they definitely haven't read the guidelines that say, we don't want you just to email your manuscript. We want you to go to the site and uh, use the form and upload your manuscript through that system. Well, what's the weirdest uh, or most interesting slush that you've encountered? Well, I guess one of the more interesting ones was uh, it actually came in the paper slush, and this... Uh, gentleman had sent his submission in in several different pieces uh, such that uh, he would send I don't know if it was I don't remember if it was one a day or one a week over a period of time and so I would get these things in and and what he had done he was a, a cartoonist on on the side and and he had decorated the backs of each envelope with a, a serial cartoon which was supposed to illustrate the process of submitting the manuscript and having it reviewed and all of those kinds of things. So it was cute, but it didn't make up for the fact that the story was just really not something that we were going to be interested in publishing. What would you say positively um, people should try to do to get as far as they can in the slush and maybe even get their book published? You know, what What's the best hints you have? for getting out of slush and into an editor's hands? Well, to me, the, the best thing is that when I open your open up the actual novel and begin to read it, that it is, it is interesting. Um, and it's, it's written in an engaging style, not necessarily a fancy style. Um, in fact, if it's too fancy, it's going to eventually get, get dry and get boring, and, and it's just not going to be something that, is going to appeal to our readership. Uh, we want things that are, that are pretty straightforward, but that are nevertheless engaging and interesting, uh, that put us in the middle of whatever action is going on, where characters we can care about are doing things that, that will make a difference. So, Gray, has anything you have recommended been published yet? Well, that's a good question. In fact, uh, two that I have uh, recommended up the chain. One took a quite circuitous route, and the other was more direct. Um, but uh, Chuck Gannon's recent book, uh, Fire with Fire, is one that I pulled out of the slush uh, very early on when I started reading the slush. Uh, one that uh, actually was much more complete in terms of... Uh, or I won't say complete. It was, uh, I had far fewer comments that I made to it. it was uh, Frank Chadwick's book that was recently published um, How under dark the title, the, yeah. How Dark the World Becomes. Yeah. We're going to have Frank's second book out in January. It's going to be called The Forever Engine, by the way. So he's going That's strong. a steampunk novel, right? Yeah. Uh, well, it's an alternate. Yeah, it's a steampunk novel. <laughs> <laughs> More or less, if if I find myself reading 
to, you know, the fifth page or the sixth page or the tenth page and forgetting the fact that I'm reading a book, then it, then that's going to be one that I am going to set aside to go over in depth at a later date. And if that happens, I will send the author a note and say, hey, I have selected your manuscript for closer examination. And I do that so that they aren't uh, waiting and waiting, wondering what's happened. Uh, but they'll, they'll know that, okay, it's, it's been set aside and, you know, somebody's going to take a closer look at this. One of the things that we stress in our guidelines is that we want folks to submit the complete manuscript and a synopsis. And the purpose for that is that if I'm going through the manuscript and the story is pretty good, but I'm not sure, that's when I will go read the synopsis so that I can see where that story is going and where it ends up. A synopsis should and have the ending in it. It's not a. It's not the back cover flap of a book you're writing there. You should tell what happens all the way through the book in a synopsis. Exactly. A good synopsis will be a, a very complete rendering of the, the basics of the story. We've been talking with Gray Reinhardt, the Bain Book's Slush Master General. Thanks so much for being with us, Gray. My pleasure, Tony. Thanks. And now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. This portion of Shadow of Freedom is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook for free, or choose from more than 100,000 other titles, including many Bane titles, when you try Audible free for 30 days. Okay, here's what has gone before. After a fierce war, Honor Harrington's star kingdom of Manticore has defeated one long-standing enemy, the Havenites, and reached a truce with another menace, the ancient aristocratic Salarian League. The Salarian League is crumbling, and rebellion is brewing. Royal Manticoran Navy Admiral Michelle Hinka, Countess Gold Peak, is in command of Royal Manticoran Naval Forces in the Talbot Quadrant, where the Sollies butt up against the systems of Manticoran allies. Gold Peak sympathizes with the rebels, but she is also wary of a conspiracy by the shadowy Mason alignment to set Manticore and the Sollies at one another's throat. Gold Peak wants the help she can provide Solly Rebels to come at a time and place of her choosing. Now in the Saltash system, that chance may finally have arrived. The governor of the system has impounded Manticoran merchant ships in a deliberate act of provocation and greed. What he has provoked, however, is the ire of the Royal Manticoran Navy. In the system now is Commodore Jacob Zavala, commander of a destroyer squadron led by the HMS Tristram, and Zavala is not leaving until those merchant ships are freed. Here is part 15 of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. Chapter 12 I didn't realize the Commodore had such a command of diplomatic language, ma'am, Alvin Tallman observed from his position in Tristram's auxiliary control over his private comlink to Naomi Kaplan. He does have a way with words, doesn't he? Kaplan replied. I've always admired a well-turned phrase, and I was impressed by his subtlety, too. And that comment about Tango 3's beta note was a nice touch. But at least nobody on the other side's going to be able to get away with claiming he didn't give them clear warning, now are they? They may not get away with it, but that doesn't mean they aren't going to try to, Skipper. Tallman pointed out. That much was a given going in. Personally, I'm with the Commodore. Better to be hanged for a hexapuma than a pussycat. Besides, Kaplan smiled coldly, we tried it their way at New Tuscany. Now they can try it our way. He's got to be crazy, ma'am, Tucker Kiernan told Oksana Dubrovskaya flatly. Five light cruisers against four battle cruisers? They got almost, what? Maybe eight tubes per broadside? Well, we've got 28 per broadside. Captain Kiernan has a point, Admiral. Captain Maximilian Johnson, SLNS Vanquishers Commanding Officer, said, 
On the other hand, and not wanting to sound alarmist, the flag captain continued, if they've got the kind of range advantage some of the wilder reports from New Tuscany indicate, they may be planning on opening fire from well beyond our range. Are you suggesting a batch of light cruisers is going to open fire at 40 million kilometers, sir? Captain Kelvin Diodoro, Debruskayer's operations officer, sounded a little more incredulous than he probably should have, speaking to someone with Johnson's seniority, but the vice admiral couldn't really blame him. I'm not necessarily suggesting anything of the sort, Kelvin, Johnson replied with a touch of frost. I would point out that 40 million clicks does comport reasonably well with the claimed range at New Tuscany, but whether or not those claims have any relationship with reality is more than I'm prepared to say. What I am suggesting, however, is that this Zavala's clearly suggesting he has a significant range advantage and he's planning to make use of it. And if it should happen he really does have that kind of range, it doesn't matter how many missile tubes we have and how many he has, since we won't be able to put fire on him without our birds going ballistic 20 or 30 million kilometers before they even reach him, at which point even a light cruiser's counter-missiles and point defense will eat them for lunch. Maximilian has a point, Admiral. Captain Meridiana Quinqueros, SLNS Successes CO, said diffidently. All eyes swiveled towards her quadrant of the communications display, and she shrugged. I doubt any ship killers a light cruiser could launch internally have anything like the range reported from New Tuscany, but they could still have more range than anything we've got. And whether or not it's going to work the way he has in mind, that's clearly what he has to intend to do if he's actually planning on engaging us at all. Point taken, Meridiana, Dubroskaya said, and turned her own gaze on Diodoro. Assume that is what he has in mind, Kelvin. Where does that leave us? We're talking about light cruisers here, Diodoro pointed out. And I don't care how missile-heavy their tactical doctrine is, light cruisers, even big-assed ones like these, can't have more than two or three hundred ship killers on board. You just couldn't fit them in, especially if they've got some kind of extended drive system to eat up still more mass and cubage. So call it fifteen hundred birds each with the warhead of one of our own Spathas. The Spatha was the SLN's new generation missile for destroyers and light cruisers, with a considerably lighter laser head than the javelins being issued to heavy cruisers and battle cruisers. If they could hit us with all of them, it'd hurt, no question, but there's no way one of them could put more than eight or nine, ten max, birds into a single salvo, and at least some of those are going to have to be penades. Without that, they wouldn't have a prayer of getting through our missile defenses. So say they give up, what, a quarter of their total launch capability for penetration aids and electronic warfare platforms? That gives the five of them a maximum throw weight of about 38 lightweight ship killers per salvo against four indefatigables. I've got to like those odds, Admiral. And if they've got any missile pods along? Dabroskaya asked. I know that's what they probably used at New Tuscany and Spindle, assuming there's any accuracy at all to what we've heard. Diodoro added the qualifier conscientiously, although he was one of the squadron's officers who was confident the rumors about Spindle were wildly inaccurate. And they could have a few along, he continued, but they can't have many. They'd have to be tractored to their hulls, or our light-speed platforms would have picked them up and you just couldn't fit more than a handful of pods big enough to carry that kind of missiles onto the skin of a light cruiser. Besides, there's still the limitations of their fire control. A light cruiser's only got so many telemetry channels, there's no way they could control pod salvos big enough to get through our defenses. I'm not saying they might not get two or three leakers through, land a couple of lucky punches, and it's possible they could have enough range on internally launched birds to engage us before we could engage them, but they're not going to be able to saturate our defenses heavily enough to let them win, especially with Spatha-grade laser heads. Not when they've got 900,000 tons of warship and we've got 3.4 million tons. I can't fault Kelvin's analysis, ma'am, Captain Ham Seung Ji of the Inexorable said. The only problem I have is that the Mantis have to be able to figure that out just as well as we can, 
and they're trying it anyway. I'd say that's because they've screwed the pooch, another voice said. The others looked up at the calm image of Captain Borden McGillicuddy, SLNS Paladin CO, and he waved one hand in a throwing away gesture. They're committed to coming down our throats, he pointed out. Even if they went to Max D cell at this point, they're still going to have to come all the way to Cinnamon Orbit before they can kill their current velocity. Whatever their damned range advantage, they're going to enter ours, whether they want to or not. You're suggesting this is some kind of bluff on their part? Ham asked. All I'm suggesting at this point is that I don't think they got their invisible recon platforms close enough to pick us up quite as early as they'd like us to believe, McGillicuddy replied. Maybe this Zavala character didn't realize what he was walking into until just before he contacted Governor Duenas. God knows we've all seen how arrogant Mantis can be. Maybe he just came bullying straight in without bothering to scout the inner system. After all, how likely was it that he was going to run into an entire division of battle cruisers in an out-of-the-way system like Saltash? By the time he figured out what he was actually up against, it was too late for him to fall back across the limit and hype her out. So maybe he decided that rather than rolling over, he'd try to run a bluff on the strength of what's supposed to have happened at New Tuscany and Spindle. And when it doesn't work? Dubroskaya asked. Then he goes ahead and rolls over anyway, probably, ma'am, McGillicuddy said and shrugged. This time limit of his is going to put him a good 30 million clicks outside our powered missile envelope when it expires. That leaves him plenty of time to change his mind and adopt a more conciliatory tone before we could blow him out of space. If I were in his place, I might figure I didn't have anything to lose throwing my threats around ahead of time. If the other side blinks, I run the table. If the other side doesn't blink, I'm no worse off than I was, and I can still surrender before he engages me. Dubrovskaya nodded slowly. McGillicuddy's hypothesis made a certain degree of sense, and Diodoro was certainly right about the limited magazine capacity and small broadside of a light cruiser. She wasn't quite as confident as McGillicuddy about the Mantis' fundamental rationality, given the fact that they'd been foolish enough to pick a fight with the Solarian League in the first place, but the captain's analysis of the other side's unpalatable tactical situation had a lot to recommend it. In fact, that was Duenas's basic plan in the first place, she reminded herself. The whole object was to draw the Mantis into an untenable position and get them to commit themselves in a way that clearly demonstrated their belligerence before they ever figured out we were here, which is basically what Borden's arguing happened after all. The governor might have hoped to have even more firepower available, but four battle cruisers against five light cruisers was an overwhelming mismatch by anyone's standards. And if she and Duenas pulled it off, if they forced an entire Manti light cruiser squadron to tamely roll over and surrender, education and information's talking heads would turn it into an overwhelming triumph, the sort of thing the Solarian public wanted to hear about as an antidote for the rumors of devastation coming out of Spindle. And let's be honest here. Borden's got a point. Duenas was luckier than hell I had even four BCs that could get here in time. If we hadn't, he'd be well and truly stuck in orbit in a leaky skin suit right now. The rest of Battlecruiser Squadron 491 was either dispersed to other star systems or in shipyard hands, but that was par for the course for Frontier Fleet. Its squadrons were always under strength and there were always too many places they needed to be at the same time. But in this instance, at least, Duenas truly had lucked out. Always assuming Borden's right about the Mantis screwing up, of course, she reminded herself conscientiously. Yet even as she did, she knew she didn't really think McGillicuddy was wrong. Assume Kelvin's estimate is off, or that they really do have more range than we do, and they get a couple of dozen missiles through our defensive basket before we get close enough to hammer them, she thought. No, make it fifty to be on the safe side. Against four indefatigables? Hell, even javelin range laser heads would hardly scratch our paint. 
No, even if Borden didn't get everything right, there's no way these bastards can hope to take me on and walk away from it. They are truly and royally screwed whatever happens, and I think I'll be able to live with being the first Solarian admiral to smack them down the way they deserve. Well, she said mildly, since they know we're here now, I suppose we might as well go ahead and get our wedges up so we can welcome them properly. They are coming out to meet us, ma'am, Abigail Hearns announced three minutes later, as the battle cruiser's nodes went fully online and a quartet of impeller wedges appeared on the tactical display and began moving away from their original position between Shona Station and Desron 301. I see them, guns. Naomi Kaplan replied almost absently, but Abigail knew that tone of voice. Tristram's CO was putting on her warrior's face, settling into predator mode while her brain whirred like another computer. We'll just have to see how serious they are about this, I suppose. Kaplan added a moment later, and her smile was hungry. For Desron 301, and especially for HMS Tristram, the Star Empire of Manticore's confrontation with the Solarian League was personal. Very personal. That was as true for Abigail as for anyone else in the ship's company, and she found herself wondering if that was one of the reasons Lady Goldpeak had picked Captain Zavala's squadron for this operation in the first place. That was David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, Part 15, read by Allison Johnson. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. Thanks to Laura Haywood Corey, Hank Davis, and March to the Stars theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. Shape shifting shadows of thankfulness to Noah's Boy author Sarah A. Hoyt and to Bain's Slushmaster General Gray Reinhardt. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. Thank you.